Hello and welcome to a Word for This Day podcast. I'm Jory Schaefer, the show's host and creator, and it is my joy and pleasure to welcome you today. Welcome back to all you regular listeners. I'm so thankful that you are here and welcome to anyone who's found us for the first time. It's no accident that you're here today, friend, so please don't run off quite yet. Please stick around for a little while and let's see what the Lord has for us today. I love thinking about God's Word with you. I love having a verse for the day and uh, studying that together or or uh, pondering it, considering it together in whatever way that you listen. Some of you listen in your cars as you're driving. Some of you listen at home uh, while you're getting ready. Some of you have it playing while you're doing other things. But in whatever way, I just pray that the Lord will bless you as you think about Him and His Word. I want you to know that I continue to pray for you. I continue to pray that the Lord will draw you closer to Him and give you more of that desire to spend that uh, quality time with Him and to think about Him and to uh, learn His Word and study His Word and memorize His Word. Oh, friends, we must be intentional about our time with Him. And so I pray that you will do that. And then uh, please consider sharing this podcast with friends, family, neighbors, strangers, just anyone who you think may receive a blessing from it. And know that I love to hear from you. I love to hear what God's doing in your life as you're spending more time with Him. I want to tell you that today is our 900th episode. Woo, we're getting close to 1,000. Uh, if the Lord should tarry, uh, it's the 170th for this year. But um, I have just loved this. I love being on this journey, as I tell you frequently. And I thank each of you who have come along the way. Well, our verse for the day for June the 18th, 2024, comes from Matthew's gospel again. Matthew chapter 6, verse 18, and it reads as follows from the Legacy Standard Bible. So that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Friends, does this sound like a uh, recurring theme that we've heard? We've talked about this uh, this concept of uh, how God wants things done differently than the world wants things done uh, much over this month and then in months previous. But we're going to park here again. And as I've told you before, sometimes when I come across a verse, I'll think, oh, we just talked about this. But if God's word says things over and over and over again, and it gives us uh, concepts over and over and over again, he did that for a reason. So we need to think about those things over and over and over again. And so I'm looking forward to doing that today. I'm excited to do that today. But we find ourselves in the gospel of Matthew. Um, you will recall, if you've been on this journey with me, that the uh, Gospel of Matthew is the first book of the New Testament, and it's the first of the four Gospels that we have listed. Those Gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That word gospel means good news, and these books do tell us the good news of Jesus' earthly ministry and what he did for us when he uh, came because God sent him to the world uh, to be our Savior. And so we read about that. We read about the the good news of the uh, life of Jesus, what he did for us. We read about his miracles. We read about his interactions with people. We read about his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And uh, that is good news because in that resurrection, he conquered death and hell and sin in the grave for all of us who would believe and who would follow him. And so I'm just so thankful. God used four different men from four different backgrounds with four different writing styles to write these gospels. And so each have a little different tone, uh, but they were all breathed out by God. They were all given to the uh, men to write under the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit. And so 
uh, we could look at these four gospels and the and the slight differences in some of the things that uh, we hear about with uh, Jesus's life to get more of a picture of what it was like while he was here. We know that Matthew and John's gospels were written by two men who were apostles. They were in that original group who saw Jesus do these miracles. They saw him interact with the people. They saw him be crucified. They saw him after he was resurrected. They saw him ascend back to heaven. These were eyewitnesses. And then two of the Gospels, Mark and Luke, were written by men who were not eyewitnesses, but they talked to those who were. And it's such a good uh, model, as I've told you before, for us. There are those of us who know Jesus now, and we could tell others who haven't met Jesus, but then they will know about Jesus, and they can tell others. And so I love this. I love this model. This is how uh, God set it up. And aren't you thankful? Aren't you thankful? that God sent Jesus and Jesus had his apostles and then his apostles told people who told people who told people and then it came all the way to us now 2,000 years later and it's such a blessing that he would do that. Matthew, the writer of this gospel, uh, was a tax collector and there's nowhere within this gospel that says I, Matthew, wrote it. We don't see that in any of the four gospels, although John refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. But the earliest church historians who received these gospels directly confirmed who the writers were. And uh, so I'm thankful for that. But as I started to say, Matthew was a tax collector. And he was called by the Lord Jesus. Jesus went by the tax collector's booth and said, follow me. And Matthew left what he was doing and followed him. His original intended audience uh, for writing his gospel seemed to be primarily the Jews because he wanted them to know that this long-awaited Messiah was here, that Jesus was this one they had looked for. And he uses, I believe it's over 60 Old Testament scriptures, Old Testament scripture references to show how Jesus is the one who fulfilled these prophecies. Mark's gospel was thought to have primarily a Roman audience based on the way he explained things, and he was thought to be a traveling companion with the apostle Peter, and it's thought that he wrote much of what Peter taught. Uh, Luke was the only Gentile writer that we have. When I say Gentile, he was not a Jew. And he seemed to have primarily a Gentile audience. Um, and then John's gospel was written later than the orig- than the first three. And his kind of tied everything together. Of course, all of God's word is for all of us. We read that all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, correction, reproof, and training in righteousness. So he has graciously given us all these. But it helps to know the original um, audience, and that uh, that way we could see from where these writers were coming, and then we could see how the Lord would use it to uh, apply to our lives, but it just gives us this fuller, richer, deeper picture. Uh, we have talked about in the last few times, because as I mentioned, we have been in Matthew's gospel a lot in this month of June so far, and it's because this Chapter 6 of Matthew just has so much teaching, so much uh, richness and depth taught by Jesus directly. These are red letters here. (laughs) And so all of God's word is truth. All of God's word is important. Um, But there's just so much jam-packed in here in these verses, in these chapters. Remember, we talked about when we've been here uh, previously this month that this falls within what was known of as the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus had started his ministry. Great crowds were following him. He was healing every disease and every affliction, and people were flocking to him to hear him teach. And when he saw the crowds, it says in chapter 5, he went up on the mountain with his disciples and sat down and began and, and began to teach. And um, he taught things differently with such authority that no one had ever heard it taught in that way. And um, he knew 
that the the religious leaders, the Pharisees, had taught things a certain way. They had taken God's law and were teaching one way, but were not often walking out what they were teaching, or they had added things to that. And so we'll see that Jesus will say, you have heard it said such and such, but I tell you, do it this way. And of course, he was God. He knew what the original intent of God's laws and God's uh, commandments and his statutes and his decrees were. Um, And Jesus was that word of God made flesh, as we read in John 114, to dwell among them. And so um, you will see that Jesus's way of doing things, God's way of doing things, is not the same as the world's way of doing things. And so he very clearly lays it out here. And he's really focusing in this chapter 6 on um, how those who claim to be followers of God, how those who uh, are religious act, and how we should act if we are true followers of God. And this is such an important concept for us to understand that the world often does not understand. They they correlate religion with faith. They correlate being religious with doing things uh, according to a certain faith or doing things rightly. But religion is, uh, unfortunately, can often... uh, deteriorate into just following rules and missing the whole point, missing the relationship with the one true living God, missing the fact that we are serving him and giving him glory and everything that we're supposed to do is for for him and his glory. It's not for us to be seen as the ones who are getting the uh, accolades or the uh, the praises or anything like that. It's to reflect on him. And that was totally different than what was going on in the in the faith world there with those who were very religious. You know, there were Pharisees and Sadducees and the priest and the high priest, and they had been charged by God to keep the commandments and to follow him and to obey him and to honor him above all. But um part of the religion became their God instead of God being their God. And sometimes that happens with us today. And so this is so important. It is so relevant for us to pay attention to this. And so you may recall that we've talked about how our righteousness does not come from following rules. Our being right in God's eyes comes from believing him, obeying him, trusting him, honoring him, uh, but it's not of our works. It's our faith in him. Uh, That's where we uh, become as right in his eyes that we believe in the the son that he sent for us. Uh, Jesus is our righteousness. He covers us with his blood, with what he's done, that sacrifice that he made for us. And so um, this, when Jesus was talking, though, was before he had... uh, offered himself as that sacrifice, but it was still, he was teaching about what what true righteousness looks like, what truly being a follower of God looks like. And so he opened it up and says in chapter 6, verse 1, beware of doing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Oh, friends, sometimes um, because of our flesh, we fall into that trap say, oh, look how good I am. Look how holy I am. Look how what a good little church girl I am. Or look how I've read my Bible. Look how I've checked my boxes. Oh, friends, may it not be that way. May what we do be to honor him to in, and to encourage others to honor and glorify and serve him. But it says, beware of doing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. That's how Jesus opens up this little section. And we talked about, he he mentioned about giving. And we spent some time there at the beginning of the month that when we give, it's not to be showy. We really It really needs to be behind the scenes such that our left hand doesn't know what our right hand is doing. And then he addresses prayer. 
um, about when we pray, it shouldn't be to be showy or to say these fancy things or for people to say, oh, look what a good uh, prayer they are. It He talked about us going in our little room in our closet behind our closed door and just communicating with the Father. And that the Father who sees what in do, is done in secret will reward you in secret. If we get our rewards out in public and in the world by those accolades from people and those praises from people, that's going to be it. But God's ways are so much better. What he has in store for us is so much better. And so Jesus was trying to to show this. And then as we talked about a few days ago, he went into that model prayer to say, and this is how you are to approach the Father. And we spent time doing that. And then we're into this section, uh, which is another one of these practices that has to do with uh, drawing closer to God, and that's fasting. And so Jesus says in chapter 6, verse 16, Now whenever you fast, do not put on a, a gloomy face as the hypocrites do. And let me remind you that a hypocrite actually means two-faced. It's saying one thing, Uh, but acting another or doing another. He says, For they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. Do you see that recurrent theme that we've seen all along? Don't give to be noticed by men. Don't pray to be noticed by men. Don't fast to be noticed by others for them to say, oh, look, they're so pious. They're religious. No, that's all you're getting. That's the only reward you're getting for that. Not that we do it for a reward, but if we are truly wanting to do the things that God wants us to do um, and draw closer to him, then uh, he he graciously blesses his children who uh, follow him. Not that we deserve it, but that's just because he's a loving father. Uh, But if we do those things just to be seen, and uh, then that's all the reward we're going to get is being seen by men and whatever little uh, pitiful stuff they give us um, in their praises or accolades. But he said, don't do it for that. Um, Don't show off that you're fasting in this case. Um, He says, but you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your father who is in secret and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So there's several things that I noticed here. First, it says, whenever you fast. Some translations say, when you fast. So it's like when you pray. It is something that, as believers, it's a practice that I think um, it's not very common, uh, but it's something that we need to consider doing. And the purpose is to... um, trust God, to focus on God, to try to eliminate distractions, and uh, just to trust him completely. Of course, Jesus did that. He fasted uh, for those 40 days and 40 nights before he was tempted, and uh, he was coming from a the standpoint of strength because he was relying completely on his Father and on the Spirit. Of course, he was one with the Father and one with the Spirit. Um, But it is a a practice that is mentioned throughout Scripture. Um, And part of that, I think, involves denying ourself, denying what our flesh wants to seek what the Father wants. And it can be fasting from food. It can be fasting from other things, um, you know, a lot of people now say, okay, I'm going to fast from social media. I'm going to fast from electronics. I'm going to uh, really take that time and focus on the Father. Uh, but God is saying, whenever you do this, don't act all pitiful and gloomy and that, and to show everybody just how much you're sacrificing. No, put oil on your face, wash your face, but they apparently put oil on their heads and make, got all slicked up and and just like there was nothing different going on. 
except between them and the Father. And it was like that with the giving. It's between them and the Father. It's like that with the praying. It's between us and the Father. Um, And it's just an important concept. We should not be doing things to show off just how spiritual we are so that people will follow us. We want people to follow him we w- because we are fallible. We are flesh. We are but dust. And everything we have, any ability, anything, comes from him to begin with. So he's the one that d- uh, deserves all the glory. Um, but Jesus says, um, the, you do this when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that it will not be noticed. So we don't need to mention to others unless you're mentioning to your spouse or something like that or or um just giving god the glory uh to say uh, no thank you i'm in the in the process of fasting or uh, hopefully you won't even have to tell anybody that you're doing that um because it's just between you and the father to draw closer to him in whatever way from whichever way that you're fasting Because, friends, in whatever we do, whether in word or deed, we are wanting to please the Father. And and we read in Hebrews that without faith, it's impossible to please Him. And so we're trusting Him. And it should just be between He and us. And, you know, on one side, that is such an encouragement because He wants that personal relationship. It's not that He wants us to show off. We really have nothing to show off other than Him. We need to boasting nothing else but him because our life should be all about him. But uh, Jesus is saying, don't do things to be noticed by men, but by your father. And then there's this wonderful promise, this wonderful statement from Jesus. And Jesus knows because he's one with the father. He says, and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. We talked about this before that sometimes when you think about a reward, you think about, oh, this is a, a big pile of money or, or something like that. But God's ways and his rewards are going to be better than anything that we could ever come up with. I'm convinced that it is so. And he will give us what is needed. He will give us what uh, we require. He will restore us. That is part of that reward. And when I think about what we read in Ephesians about how God has blessed us in um, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places because we are his. And we can't even wrap our mind around what all of those spiritual blessings are, even though he mentions those in Ephesians about that we're adopted, we're forgiven, we're redeemed. He gives us his Holy Spirit. And even if it was just that he saved us from hell, that would be the best reward ever. But God gives us so much more. He has blessed us so much more. And he has even so much more than we can ever ask or think or imagine. And so his way of doing things, the way that he has set up for things to be done is that we do not need to be showy around others, no matter what practice we're doing, uh, that what we do needs to be for his glory between us and him. And then he will take care of us. He and I, I take this as an encouragement that he will reward us, but we don't do it for a reward. He's already given us the best of everything uh, when he gave us Jesus. He's already given us the most wonderful reward when he saved our souls. So anything else is just a blessing added to blessing. And so may we thank him for that. May we ask him to guide us by his Holy Spirit um, so that if in our flesh we see that we're moving in that wrong direction and wanting to please men or wanting the accolades of men, that he will help us step back and say, no, it's just between me and you, Father. And I'm saying that as much to me. That is something that I struggle with and that I have struggled with um, is wanting to please others. Uh, But may we ask him to help us, help guide us so that we are looking for his recognition and to get his approval and for his glory, because that's what matters. 
blessings to you, friends. Until next time.